In today's message, what happens when your parent or spouse is an emotionally immature person and what you can do about it. Hi there, I'm Eileen Thompson, founder of Treasured Ministries. Welcome to our podcast and YouTube channel where we talk about conquering codependency God's way. You know, for years, I was unaware of my codependency struggle because it flew right under the radar of my confused Christianity and controlling tendencies to find love. But when God brought an awareness and an unraveling of codependency that would open my arms to real intimacy with Him, everything changed. Now, I'm not a psychologist or a therapist. Don't expect an expert on this channel. I don't even have a seminary degree, but I am a woman that found freedom from codependency through God dependency. And now I'm passionate about sharing this with others. So join me as we discover truth, experience freedom, and live treasured. So today we are starting part two of our series on the emotionally immature person. Now we began this series in our last episode. So if you want to listen to that, where we talked about what is an emotionally immature person and why this awareness matters, you can subscribe to our podcast or our YouTube channel and catch that message there. I'm also going to link those episodes um, inside of the uh, description below. But we talked about the fact um, that there are people that are emotionally immature. um, And when we are around people like this, we tend to walk on eggshells. And so last week we talked about uh, things like how to spot the difference Uh, between an emotionally immature person and an emotionally mature person. And then, you know, why do we get drawn into relationships like this where we feel like that we are walking uh, on eggshells? But, you know, sometimes uh, those relationships um, are not basically, um, we're we're already in those relationships. And uh, it could either be that you have an apparent that is an emotionally immature person, or right now you're listening and you listened last week and you thought, you know what, that describes my husband, my spouse is this is an emotionally immature person. Um, And so today we're going to be talking about how being in those types of relationships with EIPs or emotionally immature uh, people, how it impacts uh, your life. And this is important because once you have insight into this, you can understand a little bit of why you are, why you react this way and why you are the way you are. And this is important because there is a you that God designed before you were born. When he created you, He was not working from a mold. He was working on a masterpiece. And he built unique giftings uh, inside of you. And when you give those to the world, you bring his beauty. But when that becomes buried, because we've ignored that part of us, which can happen when we're in that close relationship, then the beauty just stays hidden away. And so today I have Dr. Holly Spots back on our podcast and she is going to be teaching us more about this. She is a clinical psychologist who specializes in women's mental health. She's the owner and founder of Full Cup Wellness an entirely virtual private practice serving women in California, Mississippi, and Florida. She specializes in therapy for women who are over-functioning, anxious, and people-pleasing. She helps them discover their authentic self and create deeply fulfilling lives that they love. Welcome, Holly, to our podcast again. We're so glad to have you back. 
All right. So today, today we're diving into um, part two, how an emotionally immature parent or spouse impacts uh, our life. So um, let's talk about the parental relationship first. How does it affect a child to be raised by EIP parents? Okay, yeah. So um, as I mentioned last time, so this work is really um, from the work of Dr. Lindsay Gibson. So she has several books on adult children of emotionally immature parents, which I highly recommend. Um, and so that's kind of what, I, what I'm basing this on for today. So, so Dr. Gibson says that, and, and you know, it sort of makes sense, the parent should be in service to the child. Mm-hmm. Right. That like that, that seems obvious, mm-hmm. but with an EIP parent, the child is in service of the parent. Mm-hmm. So the child becomes responsible for the parent's emotional needs. Mm-hmm. And if the, I know that sounds like a lot and it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of hard to imagine how that could unveil itself, mm-hmm. but for a child, their primary, and especially for a very young child, their primary agenda is to survive Mm -hmm. and they survive by feeling safe. And so, and that, and feeling safe comes from a bond with their parent. Mm -hmm. And so if my parents not okay, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to feel safe. So I need to do whatever it takes to keep my parent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so they start to silence their own voice. Mm. So I can't get angry because bad things are going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, the, the hard thing is that, you know, as children, we don't know any different. We, have, we haven't lived in another family. This is all we know. So children assume that their parent knows everything. Mm-hmm. So if, if they're in charge and they're, they're the good guy and they're mad or they're emotional, mm-hmm. it must be my fault. I mm-hmm. must be the bad one. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my feelings must be wrong. If I'm, you know, really upset about something and my parent yells at me and punishes me and tells me that I'm embarrassing them, um, gosh, I, as a child, I'm thinking, you know, I can't trust myself. Mm -hmm. I don't, I I start to question my own reality. Mm -hmm. I stop noticing the signals within that are saying you aren't being treated well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the child becomes very easily controlled they are always in survival mode. They're trying to prove that they are good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, you know, I, I remember once my ch- kids were pretty, especially one, when she was little, she was pretty emotional. Mm-hmm. I would have big, you know, breakdowns and things. And, and, um, and she would talk back to me too. I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I remember someone saying, you know, your children don't respect you. And I thought to myself, this has nothing to do with respect. Mm -hmm. My child feels free to have the emotions that she is feeling Mm -hmm. in front of me because she knows that I'm a safe person and that I can hold them for her. Right. And so I'm allowing her to develop into her own person and teaching her how to cope with those emotions. It's not about her bowing down to me it's about me teaching her how to become an adult who can manage herself right so yeah right which god is the perfect father and if you look in the book of psalms david processed big emotions with god and would ask where are you would would come back to a place of just you know trust but if if god allows david to do that with him and he's the perfect heavenly father then certainly um you know, we, we should model that with our children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. So a child doesn't feel safe, feels insecure, but is continually trying to find that security 
by trying to manage their parents' emotions. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they fall into the, that role. Mm-hmm. So that becomes something they're good at. Mm-hmm. Um, I see a lot of clients who are in caretaking roles in their everyday lives, whether they're parents or they're nurses or they're even psychologists like me. Um, they you know, they really identify in that role. I'm good at taking care of someone else, of calming someone else down. And a lot of that can be learned very early. Right. And of course we can make that into something good and, and, um, that becomes something wonderful about us, but we also have to be careful that we're, um, not overgiving of ourselves. Right. Right. What does it look like then, um, and we've talked about this a little bit, but for an adult child, um, you talked Mm -hmm. about, so you talked about that they can be caretakers. Um, What else as an adult child? How does that affect you when you grow up? Yeah, so you see a lot of, you know, this agreeableness, you know, this like not wanting to rock the boat. Mm becomes pretty big it's scary to rock the boat because bad things happen you know either someone's going to get mad at me or that or I'm going to disgust someone Mm -hmm. or um or they're going to even reject me or abandon me so it, it becomes pretty serious so so we start you know neglecting ourselves we don't know what we like we don't know what we want you know, someone asks us what we want for dinner. It's like, well, I don't know. What do you want? Mm -hmm. Um, we don't know what our favorite kind of pizza is. Mm -hmm. So the, so this is some of the, some of what happens as we start to people, please attune to other, other people's needs all the time, lose ourselves. Um, we become, you know, highly Mm self-sacrificing and that it can sometimes be glorified in, in, in various you know, arenas. And so we have to be careful of that, that, um, we get a lot of affirmation for doing things for others as adults. Mm -hmm. And, um, that feels good. Mm -hmm. It feels good to be wanted. It feels good to be needed. Um, it feels good to be recognized. So there's, there's also just a real deep hunger for feeling worthy for feeling wanted. Um, they're generally the, the adult children of EIPs are more of the internalizers. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that are, you know, thinking, gosh, what did I do to, I I should, I should have, shouldn't have said that he must be mad because I, I did that. They're, they're, they're self-reflecting to an extreme. Mm -hmm. Mm So, um, they expect relationships to be hard work. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that I only learned recently. You know, I always expected that relationships are just hard work and you just need to work and work and work and work. Mm -hmm. And that's just what marriage is. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I recently realized if you have a healthy dynamic, if you have a mature relationship, it's, it's not supposed to be hard all the time. It's actually supposed to be enjoyable. Right. It's supposed to bring you security and peace. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you're just not feeling free to express yourself in a relationship and you're just kind of oscillating between being angry at another person and angry at yourself, it's Mm going to create anxiety in you. Mm -hmm. You're going to start to beat yourself up and Mm -hmm. you know, your, your parents critical voice becomes your inner critic. Yeah. I'm the problem. I feel like a lot of women um, struggle with that. There's a lot of self-deprecation goes on that internal, like, this is all my fault. This is all, you know, what, what I'm doing. Um, And, and in doing that, you know, they never really step into, they never really live under God's blessing and who, who he says that they are because Mm -hmm. of, you know, that, that drumbeat, um, from the past. And it's so interesting to me how much, you know, what we marinate in growing up, how much that shapes, um, you know, 
molds our thinking and and, and shapes shapes our lives. Um, are there yes. are there different types of EIP parents? Yes, actually there are. And so Dr. Gibson names four. Um, and so the the first she actually calls emotional, which is just basically like a highly emotional parent. So this might fall more in the borderline personality disorder kind of category, Mm -hmm. but it's, um, this is a person that's dominated by their feelings. They are highly reactive, easily overwhelmed. Um, their moods are unstable. Um, small things are a big deal. Um, they, um, see others as saviors or abandoners. And so, you know, you might be up on their pedestal because you did something for them. And then, you know, the next day, you know, you might set a boundary or something and now you've abandoned them. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. um, that's, so that's the emotional parent. Then there's, um, there's the driven parent. So we, you know, we often don't think about this parent as emotionally immature, but they are. So, So a highly goal-oriented and busy parent, this is the parent who's constantly moving forward, trying to perfect everything, including others, including their children. Mm -hmm. So they run a tight ship in the home. Mm -hmm. They have very little sensitivity to their children's emotional needs. So this might be... um, you know, a parent that's got their kids in six activities a week. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, that, that there, if that works for your child and your child loves those, those activities and they are, um, they are a part of that decision, you know, wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's not the busyness that's the problem. It's the lack of attunement to their child's emotional needs. That's the problem. So they don't know like maybe how a different handle... mode of driving it, not like this. Oh, my child wants to play soccer five days a week, but I want him to play soccer five days a week because right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want him to. And if he has a tough day on the field, um, I don't really know how to, how to handle that. So mm-hmm. I, I just tell him, you know, you'll do better next time. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how to sit with those feelings. Mm -hmm. I just, I just push them away and we just move on. Mm -hmm. Um, And I get everybody going again, real fast, a lot of distraction and let's keep moving. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the driven parent. Um, And then there's the passive parent. And this, this is interesting because the passive parent doesn't, doesn't totally fit most of the other uh, characteristics. Um, The, the passive parent, is the one who's generally like the nicer parent They they might be the favorite parent they um they seem to enjoy their children they might be like the soccer coach on their mm-hmm. kids team um but they lack deeper empathy and will not step in to protect their child from another parent if another parent becomes abusive or um, inappropriate with their child, they will back up the dominant parent, even to the point of overlooking abuse. So a lot of people describe this dynamic in their parents, um, of, of origin. So we've got like one parent that was more either, um, emotional or just, um, in, in charge, rejecting and, and dominant. And then we have this other parent that was, nice um but very passive and kind of just did whatever the other parent wanted them to do Mm -hmm. so we like the child often really loves this passive parent but through their works sometimes they uncover that gosh this parent didn't protect me either right and 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 it was because they didn't know how to sit with emotion Mm -hmm. they didn't have the skills Mm -hmm. to communicate a boundary. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's a passive parent. And then the last one is the rejecting parent. And this is more in the narcissistic range. So um, not interested in relationships, typically all about me, 
avoid much interaction and expect the family to center around their needs. Um, don't tolerate other people's uh, differences. Generally wants to be able to do whatever it is that is best for them mm -hmm. um, without thinking about what would someone else would want. And they become very angry if things don't go their way. Right. So right. a child can feel very, very rejected by this kind of parent. Right, right, <laughs> right. Okay, so the the obvious one, you know, would be like the rejecting parent. But I would think if you were a child and you had, say, a passive parent mm -hmm. and the parent was nice, but then one day something happens and your mom didn't, you know, protect you or she didn't, that that would feel, you know, like abandonment. And so, yeah. um, and so that's why really, you know, kind of labeling all this helps because mm -hmm. then you can say, you know, that this was not my fault and this was, you know, just how this person, um, was wired or wasn't able to, to deal with these, uh, emotions. Um, mm -hmm. so what about if your spouse is the EIP? you know, um, is the relationship doomed? If you, if you've listened to this and you're like, Oh, that describes who I'm married to. What? No. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> I don't think so. There That's may good. be some relationships mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. doomed and it's mm -hmm. not like it's, you know, all or none. Um, there may be, you know, some people uh, on the higher end of that spectrum that um, are just not able to make any changes. And so um, you, th that, that can certainly happen. But I think that there is certainly power in one. You can change things for yourself mm -hmm. and that already feels good. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so I, I talk to people about, about being a leader in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I know, you know, traditionally women aren't the leader of a relationship, mm -hmm. but I personally believe that, um, you know, God has blessed us all with different traits mm -hmm. and qualities and abilities. Mm -hmm. And um, if you tend to have the values that are more in line with a mature relationship, it's okay to, to set that expectation and to guide them um, by sharing with them, you know, what it is that you want, how you want to be treated. And so I think, you know, um, and it's, I know it's kind of a vague answer. Like, are you, are you doomed? I don't know. It, 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 it really, I really think that people should go into therapy. If they find themselves in this situation, I highly recommend just getting a good therapist and going in and saying, you know, I'm just confused. I don't know. I, uh, you know, I, I need to just work this through. Mm -hmm. But if you are, if you're trying to communicate something to an EIP, it is so important that you stay calm and non-reactive. So remember any bit of emotion is very threatening for them and, and triggering, arousing for them. Mm -hmm. So you want to stay, you want to do the opposite. You want to stay very calm and almost flat um, and non-reactive. So do not engage in a fight. Do not blame. Do not, um, you know, things like, well, you did this, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. an EAP will not hear that. They, they simply will not hear it. It's wasted words. Um, so being, you know, there, there's kind of this, um, there's a way of expressing our needs that is much more likely to get you the response that you want. And, and this is called the, the three-part communication model. Oh, I love a three-step with how you a deal with difficult step. people. Yeah. <laughs> Lay a it on step. us. Okay. Three-stepper. Okay. Okay. So first of all, you want to keep your feedback very short and to the point. Mm -hmm. So you want to plan this out in advance. If you're going to give your EIP some feedback, you want to think this through in advance, maybe even write it down. Don't just 
you know, word vomit because they cannot tolerate that and Mm -hmm. it will not go well and you will leave feeling very frustrated. So, um, so first part of the model is um, their perspective. So you think to yourself, um, what is their perspective in this? So, um, you know, say, um, say, you know, your partner tends to kind of belittle you or make fun of you in front of other people. They tease you. Mm -hmm. And you know that, you know, they've maybe even said it before. They're just playing. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't mean anything by it. Mm -hmm. Um, They are just being fun. Okay. So that is their perspective. Mm -hmm. So I would put that out there first. I would say, if I, if I want to tell my partner, I don't want them to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I would start with, I know that you're just playing. I know that this, you know, this doesn't feel like a big deal for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then second part is my perspective. Okay. So what's it like for me, you know, when, when my partner does this, Mm -hmm. I feel maybe embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I feel, um, outed. I feel like we're not on the same team. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I need to defend myself. Mm -hmm. I feel hurt, Mm -hmm. you know, all these things. So you, you got to like pick one Mm -hmm. or two and say, you know, so that's your perspective. This is how I see it though. This is how I experience it. I feel embarrassed and hurt that you would say something about me in a negative way to other people. Right. Okay. That's part two. Part three is what you want or need from the other person. Mm -hmm. So that might be what, you know, what I really need is for you to not do that. I mean, that's a simple one. Just don't do it. Um, you know, what I really need is um, for you to, you know, keep the conversation on whatever's going on in the present instead of talking about things that have happened outside of the space, whatever it is that you want or need. And then you ask them, can you do that for me? So you get buy-in. Can you do that for me? So generally, EIPs can take this in. They, um, they appreciate the briefness. Mm-hmm. They uh, appreciate that you've given them some um, credit mm-hmm. by acknowledging their perspective. Mm-hmm. And you're not just coming as an attack. Mm-hmm. And they also appreciate that you're asking them specifically for what can be done differently. And now they know what to do. Okay. So, so that's a model that can be really helpful. And it, and it's also you, again, being the relationship leader, mm-hmm. you know, being able to say, um, this isn't working for me mm-hmm. and I'd like to talk about it mm-hmm. and doing so in a very calm, mature way mm-hmm. and, and keeping it short, short and sweet. Yeah. I, I love this three step skill set that you're giving us for, confronting others because I'm assuming you know you can really use this with with anybody not Anyone. just with an EIP person Anyone. and um you know in confronting others that's something um that you know that I have had to learn how to do it was like a muscle that was atrophied so I didn't know how to do it and so I love learning um, all these things and then it's fair to the EIP because you're telling them this is what I don't like, but then also setting a boundary. This is what, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I need to see happen. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, you're going to know is the relationship doomed or not because you know, if that person responds to it or not, if they, you know, if, if they're, if they're able to change. Um, and, Mm -hmm. and sometimes I think I, I can see, with an EIP where if you didn't have this to do, then it would either sort of be the all or nothing thing. Like you either, 
you know, go back to being quiet Mm -hmm. and not saying anything or just pretending until one day you get really upset or tired of it and then you just explode. So you acknowledge their perspective, then you state your perspective, and then you give them um, what what I really need is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to be a broken record. You know, sometimes they come back with like an automatic, like uh, emotional response. They get Mm -hmm. triggered, you know? Mm -hmm. And so again, you acknowledge it inside. Okay. They got triggered. Um, Let me start from the beginning Mm -hmm. and you just go right through it again. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, that's enough. And they kind of go, okay, they heard you that time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes three times. Sometimes they will never hear you. And that's when, you know, you know that you need to take some space from this person because you've, you've done everything you can do to, Mm -hmm. to be heard and you, you've handled it in the most respectful way possible and you're still being stepped all over. And so that's when you need the, the physical distance. Right. When you are communicating with an EIP and doing these steps and confronting, what would you tell a woman like what should your goal be in other words I think um like if the goal is oh they're gonna I think a lot of times I've had these Pollyanna goals like Mm -hmm. we're gonna have this conversation and then we're gonna go Mm -hmm. skipping off into the sunset together (laughs) you know and then when it I it took so much courage to have the conversation and then it didn't work out or you know, I wasn't validated. And then I would just spiral down. And then I would say, well, I'm just not going to do that again. So yeah, I think we we have these, we call them healing fantasies. You know, yes. Oh, that's good. Holly. (laughs) That we can heal this person and we can Mm -hmm. heal this relationship. And we're going to be all good, all Mm -hmm. good to go. Mm -hmm. And that, that simply isn't, if that is the goal, then you will fail every time. Mm -hmm. And and that, and that feels terrible. Mm -hmm. So the goal has to be for yourself. Mm -hmm. How did I handle myself? Mm -hmm. Am I proud of the way Mm -hmm. I showed up? Mm -hmm. Am I proud of how I spoke my needs? Um, And did I take care of myself if it did not go well? Did I walk away and tend to myself? Mm -hmm. Um, So, so that's your measure. How did you do? Mm -hmm. Not how did they respond? Their response cannot be part of the, um, the measure of success. Of success. Yeah. Is your responsibility is to speak the truth and love. And, and I think to looking at, Like, I love the part about drawing boundaries and thinking through the boundaries that you're drawing as loving towards that person, because it might get them, they're not going to get rewarded again for, you know, they're treating you a certain way or um, that kind of thing, like, uh, like Mm -hmm. they did before. So, so you, you mentioned, um, then let's say that the confrontation goes flop and they just blame and or gaslight or whatever. Um, you mentioned like then the reaction to that, like how did I take care of, of myself? So so expand on that. If somebody is in a relationship with the EIP, um, how do you tend to your heart? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can be really challenging, Um, but I think you have to remember that you are not crazy, Mm -hmm. you are not selfish, Um, and this, you know, this is really the work of therapy is redefining yourself from from what's been put on you by other people, the Mm -hmm. roles and expectations and beliefs that others have put on you. so, you know, ther- therapy, I think, of course, as, as a therapist, I, that's, you know, that's how I, I work through these things. Um, and so a huge advocate, but a lot of people struggle with um, therapy, feeling like a betrayal of their partner. You know, if I'm, 
if I go to therapy and talk about my partner and tell someone what's actually happening, you know, am I, am I not being a good, good wife? Am I, am I betraying them? Um, and I think that that's something important to, to, to look at if, if there is an expectation from your partner that you not go to therapy because it's a betrayal, there is control in that mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. and, um, that is not healthy. Mm -hmm. And so you are only bearing your burdens in a safe place, which is what God has instructed us to do, whether you're in prayer or you're talking to another safe person, mm -hmm. but, um, you're creating a safe space where you can listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing when we're in a relationship with an EIP, we can't hear our own thoughts anymore. It becomes crazy making. It's like, what, you know, what I'm so confused. Like what, what, what just happened? Right. Um, I guess I am, you know, the problem. So being able to go into a safe space, um, whether it's in prayer or with a friend or with a therapist and bear bear yourself mm -hmm. and seek wisdom. Mm -hmm. Um, so big red flag, if your partner says that you are wrong for doing that, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's how cults work. Um, mm. it's, you know, keeping it inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, you're not crazy. You're not selfish. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to look at those messages that you've been told about yourself, either from your parents or your past partners or your current partner. Um, and, and we have to start pulling that onion apart and looking at mm -hmm. like what's deep inside there. What, what did God put there mm -hmm. that we're not able to access because all these other people have put their junk on top of that. And so we want to get to that core you yeah. and yeah. that that's where we redefine our worth, right? You know, that's when we can kind of redefine the definition of am I worthy Yeah. Um, if I'm not, you know, bowing down to all these other people or serving in all, in all these other capacities in my life. And I'm actually um, taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. So kind of being able to define our self-worth based on our values. What, what does yeah. God say? Yeah. And I think, you know, so um, I, I love what you said here because you've got to take personal responsibility for that, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, we can stay like this person is always saying this and I'm always doing that. And I grew up at a home like this and all that's true. But if you take personal responsibility um, to, to process, yes. then you're not bound to that anymore. And, and it is painful and you have to get out of the orbit. And so it's, it's, you know, it's almost like, okay, I don't even know how to begin this process, right, of, of mm -hmm. figuring out who I am. But the good news is, is that that's a journey that God 2000% wants to take with you. And so, mm -hmm. um, I go to therapy. Um, I think therapy is great. I have a great Christian therapist who also got his PhD from Duke. So he's got the science background is wonderful to talk to. And I love mm -hmm. doing that. Um, but you know, you can always, and I do this on a daily basis process with God and talk mm -hmm. to him. And he's the one that, that created you. And so um, that's a great piece of good news that where, you know, God wants to fill every relational need uh, that, that you have and that he's there with you to help uncover, you know, all the what's been buried through these layers in our life so that the real you can come forward so that you can know that. And I don't care if you're listening and you're 60, it's never too late. I always say like mm -hmm. Joshua conquered the promised land when he was 80. It's never too late, right? For us, for us to start living um, a, as God intended 
and to take ownership over that. And you can do that. And you may be listening today saying, you know, I don't even know where to begin because, you know, you're describing my childhood and I turned off a long mm-hmm. time ago. I shut my heart down. Well, in the next podcast, um, Holly is going to be giving us a roadmap for how we can start to just awaken uh, your real authentic self, who God created you to be, how you can start to awaken um, these things within you. And, um, and so I can't wait uh, for the next podcast. Um, and really, this is really kind of the bedrock, don't you think, of, um, of, of being able to be in relationship with anybody is knowing who you are and staying true to that um, uh, and letting that be the guide to, to, uh, to your life. Um, what, any closing thoughts today, Holly? Um, I just completely agree. I think you've totally got it, Aileen. Um, and I, I, I just think this is so powerful. We're not only stepping in as relationship leaders and as, really, as, you know, as leaders for ourselves, but um, we are we can be a family leader. We can mm-hmm. stop a generational cycle mm. of emotional maturity mm. once and for all. Right. So that's powerful. Yeah. It's creating a whole new legacy for your family Mm -hmm. to say, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this to my kids. I don't want them to do it to their kids. Mm -hmm. And so even if you have grandchildren already, it's okay to say, okay, y'all, I, I I want to talk about some things that happened. and And I realized that, you know, maybe I wasn't mature enough at the time to handle that well, but uh, this is something I'm working on and I want to do it differently. Yeah. And, um, it is, you know, it's starting to, 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 um, cultivate that it's a very important gift that you can pass on for many generations. 2000%. So it's never too late and pioneering is walking new roads, but you have God to lead you on this roadmap. And Holly is going to give us um, a structure, a roadmap, which you can start to incorporate right now, um, right where you are. And so I hope that you'll join us for our third part in this series on emotionally immature uh, people or EIPs, as the experts refer to them. And so (laughs) (laughs) we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.